It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. Our guest today is Billy Winner Davis, and this is the mother of reality winner. Uh, you might recall this story uh, back about three years ago, 2017. Uh, kind of just came and went in the news. A young lady was uh, working for some kind of private contractor. She had a security clearance, and she was kind of a whistleblower and sent some information to the Intercept uh, regarding Russian interference in our election, which is something that everybody's talking about now. But reality winner uh, was sentenced uh, to prison for this, and she's been in there ever since 2017, and she's not set to get out uh, until 2021. We have her mom with us now. Uh, Billy Winter Davis, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Yes, thank you so much. And you have our condolences. I know what it's like to have a family member uh, sitting away there in those kind of conditions. It's horrible. Um, tell us about yourself. Who is Billy Winter Davis? Well, um, up until three years ago, I was just a regular person. I'm a social worker. I have a social work degree, and I spent my life working in child protective services for the state of Texas. Um, three years ago, my life changed drastically because my beautiful young daughter, who had just uh, gotten out of the Air Force, took a job in Georgia with a private contractor, decided that she would be the one to release the proof of Russian election attacks in 2016. And so that pretty much... Um, changed our lives drastically. Uh, I'm the mother of two very beautiful and intelligent and wonderful daughters. Uh, my daughter, Brittany, is 30, 30 years old. She just turned 30, and she's expecting her first child. Mm. She has a PhD in toxicology and pharmacology. I'm so very proud of her. Reality is my youngest daughter, and she is now 28 years old. As you said, she's spent the last three years in prison um, for an act of conscience. Um, Reality is, um, you know, somebody who cared deeply about her country and her community. And, um, you know, so here I am just trying to do everything that I can do to support her, to raise awareness and to grow the advocacy for her out there. When is the the grandbaby due? The grandbaby, uh, believe it or not, my daughter's actually due on reality's birthday, ah. December 4th. Beautiful. Yes. <laughs> oh, my, right around the corner, too. My God, you must be all excited. Uh, it's a shame. I though, am excited. It, it's a shame, though, that reality can't be there uh, when her sister's giving birth. Every sister wants to have their sister there um, in the maternity room there and then the, the birthing room, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but maybe we'll have a, a Christmas miracle. Tell yes, us about re- reality. What is reality winner like? We see in the news a story that, oh, my God, a traitor, a spy, all this kind of craziness. But what is reality winner really like? Oh, my goodness. It's very hard to describe reality. Um, She is extremely intelligent. She's always been very smart, and she's always had a thirst for knowledge. She studies anything that she can. Um, Even as a child, she always, you know, was reading, studying. Um, You know, she taught herself Arabic because she had a a dream to join the Air Force and she had a dream to be a linguist like her older stepbrother and she really wanted to be a a Middle Eastern linguist. The the attacks on um, our country, 9-11, really affected her. It made a huge impact on her and even at her age. I mean, she was only like 9 or 10 at the time. Mm. But even at her age, I you know, I saw her, she started paying attention to the world, paying attention to what was going on. And, you know, I think it it had such a great impact on her that she, she kind of started, you know, looking at how she could help. And so she did. Um, She joined the Air Force even before she graduated from high school. 
and she was accepted into the linguist program. She was accepted into the Middle Eastern linguist program as she wanted to be. She served in the Air Force for six years. She was part of intelligence, and so most of her time in the Air Force was actually spent at the NSA. She worked at both Fort Meade, and she also was selected for um, a special deployment at Fort Gordon in Georgia. Um, aside from being a linguist in the Air Force, Reality also learned the love of yoga and meditation. She is a certified yoga instructor. She also became a certified spin instructor. And also during her time in the Air Force, she worked on a special project to make sure that the service members were also in physical shape, you know, because they were doing the annual testing, the physical testing, fitness testing for the service members. And so Reality actually also worked, um, you know, kind of volunteered for a program that helped her fellow soldiers to keep in physical shape. Um, Reality is also an artist. She can paint like nobody's business, and she also sketches. I mean, she's extremely talented. And so um, she's, she's just a beautiful young woman. She's always volunteered for her community wherever she was. In Maryland, they had a wonderful program called Athletes Serving Athletes, where the runners would push uh, disabled children in these um, high-tech wheelchair type things where they would actually do half marathons and 10-mile and races with these children so that these children could be part of races and could actually you know, cross that finish line. And that was something that she was very, very passionate about. So um, right before her arrest, she was actually also um, training to, for weightlifting competition. And so that was another thing that she really was looking forward to right before her arrest. She also fostered animals. She fostered a dog, and she adopted a cat. So she loves animals as well. Uh, when I was reading the Wikipedia page, it described that she had a fascination with the Middle East, but it also said that she had a sympathy for bin Laden and for the Taliban. Well, she didn't have a sympathy for bin Laden at all. Hmm. I think that my daughter, through her studies, came to realize that the Taliban didn't equal terrorism. The Taliban are really not a terrorist organization. There are, there are groups of Taliban who became terrorists, but the Taliban, if you study it, isn't about terrorism. You know, and I think that she was one where she would actually go and she would learn about things you know if, if something was out there she would go and she would learn more about it and so you know and she didn't she didn't sympathize with the Taliban she just understood that not all Taliban equals terrorists and she absolutely did not sympathize with bin Laden if you look at my daughter's uh, commendation from the Air Force you'll see that she was instrumental in identifying somewhere around 900 enemy targets and these were t were terrorists that my daughter took out of the field yeah i saw some figures on one occasion it was 100 another occasion it was 600 i saw um, online um, now in your relationship with your daughter did she ever express any extremist uh, political or religious views in, in your opinion no, not at all. Not ever. Okay. My daughter has studied religion. Um, she has studied all religion. And she, she really, she was studying just to have an understanding. She likes to really to have an understanding and she has an acceptance of different cultures and different religions in different ways. But my daughter is Jewish. Okay. Okay. Are, are you Jewish as well? No, I'm not. No, I am not. Okay. And was she practicing Jew? 
Yes, she is. Really fascinating. Okay, there is something you don't hear at all. Okay, and, and also too, now, no, it, you don't see that. Well, I, I'm going to ask you. One of the questions I'm going to ask you too is, what are the misconceptions? Well, let's get to that right now. What are some of the misconceptions the average person has about reality winner that you'd like to clear up? Well, the biggest misconception was, of course, that she was a Taliban sympathizer and that she wanted to, you know, move to the Middle East to join the Taliban. Hmm. That absolutely is not true. Um, what the government did was they picked apart things from my daughter's life, from her studies, from her online searches, just like they could do with any of us. And they put together a picture of her that... It wasn't false, but it wasn't the truth. I, I don't know how to make sense of that, but you know, basically if we only take one piece of who you are and we blow it up, we can make you to be anything that we want you to be. And so, you know, because my daughter, uh, she excelled at her job with the Air Force and she excelled at her job with the NSA to identify, you know, enemy targets in the Middle East. My daughter did. She read a lot of online things about, you know, the Middle East, and she read their news. She she always kept up with what was going on over there because it was part of who she was. It was part of her job. It's almost like an undercover police officer, an undercover cop. Mm. Do we then associate them, you know, and say that they're a bad person? You know, if you if you just pick those pieces of their life. You know, all you're going to see is that and you can make them into the criminal. But no, they're doing their job. And that's what my daughter did. She she did her job for our country. Um, you know, another huge misconception is that she sold out her country or that she was actually guilty of espionage. My daughter was charged under the Espionage Act because they really couldn't find another law to twist to charge her with to that would make her look like this villain she's not the villain here my daughter didn't um my daughter didn't have any ties to russia or to any other country what my daughter leaked was a document that we our election was under attack by the russian government that to me is not a traitor that's not a spy that's not espionage my daughter did what she did anonymously. She wasn't selling anything. She didn't get any money for what she did. She wasn't looking for fame. Um, the only reason my daughter released the document that she released was so that we, the American people, would know that we were being attacked. They, they said she worked, uh, not worked, she served six years in the United States Air Force. In basically in intelligence and uh, working with the NSA. Yes, that's has, what she did. Has there ever been an allegation that she has revealed any of that intelligence information that she had while working for the NSA or working for the U.S. military that she's ever released any of that? No, not at all. There's not at never all. Never been. Not at all. Um, during the pretrial, that is the reason why the government fought so hard. They said, you know, that that's what they used to keep her in jail, to deny her bond, to deny her bail, is they said she had so many secrets in mm. her head that she could release. But yet six years in the Air Force and she, I mean, she never released anything. You know, she, she has no intent of causing harm to the United States of America. Look at the document that she did choose to release. The document that she released was something that we needed to know that really shouldn't have been hidden from us. It shouldn't have been classified. A quick question. Now, while she was held in pretrial detention, was she held in solitary or was she able to, to uh, circulate among the other uh, uh, detainees, the other... Uh yeah, she was not in solitary confinement during her pretrial. She was being held in a very small county jail in rural Georgia, in okay. Lincolnton. Uh, it's a very tiny jail, and so she was kept in the women's section, which held up to 20 uh, females at a time. But being in the county jail, that meant that she had to 
basically live with whatever was being brought off the streets. And she was in that county jail for about 15 months. Oh, boy. Yeah, those, those are miserable conditions, yeah. Now, this company she went to work for after the U.S. Air Force was a civilian company. Was it? Yes. Okay. Yes. But she had a security clearance, and by releasing this information, she violated her con- security clearance, or she violated a non-disclosure agreement with this private company? She just uh, she violated her non-disclosure agreement with this company. How does that become a criminal charge? Uh, the government charged her with willful retention of and transmission of national defense information. I don't know how, but they basically this is what they use when we have when you have leakers and whistleblowers who release top secret information to the media. Gotcha. Now, what was in this uh, material that she released? What, what was in there that uh, we should be so concerned about to national security? Uh, that's a threat to, to my safety and your safety that we shouldn't know this information. I have not been able to figure that out, and no one else has either. The government basically said that she did grave harm to our national security, but they never backed that up with any kind of information. The document that my daughter released was about a four-page intelligence summary, which outlined how the Russians had sent these spear phishing emails to voting and election emails, uh, email sites and computers trying to gain access to the voting software. So that's what she released. I don't know how the government can come out and say that what she released was, you know, harmful to our national safety or, you know, our national security, because that's what my daughter released. Now, especially looking backwards in hindsight, where we are today in 2020, uh, the worst year in history uh, in 2020, uh, because this is in the Mueller report. This is in the indictment against Roger Stone. This is in WikiLeaks. This, this everyone's talking about this now. So, like, the cat's out of the bed. Whether the cow's out of the barn, right? <laughs> At this point, uh, is there anything new, a different, or, or or top secret in what she released and what everyone talks about today? No. Um... You know, everyone, like you're saying now, everyone has used that document. Everyone has used that information. And so to keep her in prison really is just punitive. It's just cruel and punitive because the information that she released since that release has been used, has been used by the Mueller investigation. It's been used by Congress. It's been used by everyone to, you know, to investigate the Russian election attacks in 2016 but yet you have this young woman who is still in prison because she's the one that released it and what we have to ask ourselves here in america is if reality winner had not released this would it have ever seen the light of day would they have kept it so classified would Mueller have had access to it? You know, would the Senate Intelligence Committee have had access to it? Because nobody knew before my daughter released this. Why, why do you think it is that, that reality has kind of uh, slipped through the cracks here, the media cracks, the, uh, the attention cracks, uh, that Assange gets all this attention and Snowden gets all this attention? Uh, and uh, I forget the other one... Uh, too as well. How come she's not getting that same kind of grassroots support that they get? Uh, it's been such a struggle these last three years, over three years. Um, you know, first and foremost, the government painted her in such a horrible light, you know, when they when they released their press release and the information about her. They made her toxic. And then we've had to battle with those other groups you know, claiming that she wasn't a true whistleblower, 
she didn't follow the avenues, you know, that a whistleblower should follow. She didn't do things the right way. What she did was she snuck a document out of the NSA and she mailed it to a media outlet, you know. And so there's so many people who say that what she did didn't fall under the whistleblower, you know, um, to, to meet that criteria, you know. And then another thing is, you know, these last four years have been super crazy, um, you know, with regard to even trying to concentrate on one thing in the news, because yeah. something that is news yesterday becomes forgotten today because there's even something more crazy that comes out. And so there's just not room enough for everyone to keep their attention on the important things and so she quickly got buried and so you know like our group that's all that we do is we just try to keep her name out there so that she's not forgotten in right. all of this craziness yeah one more time that website is standwithreality.org standwithreality.org now, you're saying that she didn't follow the, the, the standard whistleblower process. Now, I, I can understand if you're a government employee, okay, fine. You don't have to make internal reports and you go to the attorney general's office, the inspector general's office, these kind of things. But as a civilian, uh, how is it not following standard procedure to go to the media? And that's something that a lot of people don't understand is she wasn't a government employee, so she didn't have those avenues available to her. And so she did what she, whatever she felt like she could do to get this information out. You know, she didn't have the avenues that were available to a government employee. And so she was just, uh, you know, a civilian. She was just like you and I. So she did what she could do to get this information out there. And, and it appears also, too, just from looking at this, is that more attention is paid to the intercept and the way they handled or mishandled um, this whistleblower information uh, than there is to the plight of reality who's sitting right now in a – and by the way, who caught COVID, right, while she was in, in incarcerated. Am I correct? That's correct. She did. She caught COVID. She's recovered, thank goodness. Um, and we hope that she doesn't catch it again. Right. Okay. Now, but give us a, an idea, a little uh, synopsis here of what is the controversy with Intercept and the way they handle this uh, information. The Intercept, from what I understand, you know, when they received this document, they had to authenticate it, which clearly they had to. Here they, they received an envelope with no name, no return address. It was postmark Augusta, Georgia, and they, they, you know, started looking at it, and it looked like something really important, but they had to make sure that it was real. And so they reached out to, you know, the NSA and the FBI in order to say, hey, we have this document. We need to know, you know, what we're looking at. And I believe that the mistakes that they made were, you know, they took the actual document with them or a copy. They actually told the FBI where it was postmarked from. And um, and then the document they gave, I believe that they gave the FBI a copy of the document, and the document contained um, these printer marks on it, which the NSA embeds for all of their printers. So the NSA and the FBI were quickly able to establish, you know, where what printer was used. The, the NSA was able to quickly, you know, um, look at, from the printer used, how many people had actually um, loaded this document, and there were six people, one of which was Reality Winner. They, from the postmark, they were actually able to uh, look at where it was mailed. It was mailed from a mailbox right outside my daughter's yoga studio, and they were very quickly able to establish that this was Reality Winner that they were looking at. You know, and from there, they went to her social media. They looked at what kind of a person she was. She was an anti-Trumper, and they just connected the dots. Now, you know, had the Intercept, like, maybe not given the FBI a full copy of this document, had not told them exactly where it was postmarked, it, made, it would have made their job a lot harder trying to actually pin it on reality. The mistakes that were made made it clear that 
reality was going to be arrested very quickly and that she wouldn't be able to deny it. She wouldn't be able to say that it wasn't her that did this. So, and while they made mistakes, um, my daughter also made mistakes. My daughter did not cover her tracks at all. Um, she just, she wasn't a criminal. Hmm. She was somebody who was just trying to get the information out there. And so she made mistakes, the Intercept made mistakes, and we are where we are. What I do have to say is that, you know, First Look Media, they stepped up and they used the Freedom of the Press Foundation funds for my daughter's legal defense. And they have supported her 100% through this process. And so I'm very, very grateful to First Look Media for everything that they've done. And there have been some tremendous um, journalists at First Look, I mean, at First Look Media and at The Intercept that have tried to keep her story out there, you know, and I'm grateful to them for that as well. So if people want to, want to donate to Reality's Defense, they can go to First Look Media and, and say, listen, this donation is targeted, specified for Reality Winner? Well, there really is no fund for her defense anymore hmm. um, because, you know, her criminal case is, is over. Um, she Her legal team continues to work for her pro bono. Um, they're trying to obtain compassionate release for her now that the COVID pandemic is, you know, upon us. And they're working on an appeal right now um, to appeal the judge's decision to deny her even a court hearing to uh, look at compassionate release. And her attorneys right now are all working pro bono. Mm. And so there's really not the need for people to go and donate to her criminal defense because there is no criminal defense anymore. My daughter pled guilty to the charge. I got you. Now, when, when Reality sent this letter over to the Intercept, uh, this material, uh, did she include like a cover letter with a little explanation of what this is and what I'm trying to accomplish here? No, she did not. She folded it up, put it in an envelope, and she mailed it. Okay. Did she wear gloves at least when she did this? I hate to ask. But did she at least wear no, gloves? She did. She no. did. did she? No, she did, oh, no, I, she I did love not. Her. Okay, keep this kid away from me. Oh, my God. I can just see reality as a teen, as a, ch a child with the cookies, the cookie jar <laughs> in, her, in her room under the pillow, you know? Oh, my God. We, we shouldn't be laughing, though, because this is someone in human life that, that had just went through COVID. You know, even Michael Cohen, they let him out uh, just for a COVID scare. This is a young lady that actually had COVID, um, who's basically charged with the same crime as these other characters, Stone and Manafort and Flynn and all of them, and Papadopoulos. They're all in gates. They're all walking around uh, right now free as a bird. And we have this one kid in here. She's about to be an aunt, uh, sitting under these horrible uh, prison conditions. We can get into that, too, because uh, when you put a person in prison, their whole family's in prison everyone they love everyone in contact with is suffering along with them uh, for all this time and once again too this kid is doing a lot more time than the clients i deal with every single day of the week i got guys who uh, in 2000 in june of 2017 same time she was sentenced guys sentenced for for uh, uh, burglary and car theft they were they're out on parole they're, they're violating parole they're back in out on parole again for a second time commit our new charges uh, back in and they're going to be getting out sooner than this young lady okay that that's what our criminal justice system is uh, so this is a very targeted prosecution here against this young woman reality winner and you can uh, support her by going to uh, standwithreality.org uh, we're with her mother now uh, billy winner davis Give, give me an idea. What happened now when, when the cops show up at her door? So on June 3rd of 2017, my daughter went grocery shopping, as she always did on Saturdays. And she arrived at her house, and she was basically followed into her driveway with, by uh, an FBI SUV, the black SUV. And two of the agents got out and basically approached her and told her, you know, that they needed to talk to her. She really, I mean, what she had told me was she, she had thought maybe it had to do something with her clearance, mm. you know, uh, because every once in a while they, they'll do these, um, what do you want to call them, the investigations just to um, do little their, their spot clearance. Check. little spot check. Um, yeah. Right, yeah. So 
she at first, you know, had no idea what was going on. And then when they indicated that, you know, that they had a search warrant, they told her she, they had a search warrant for her house, her phone, and her person, and her vehicle. And so they asked her for her car keys. They asked her for her cell phone. Um, you know, they asked to go into the house, asked her if she had any weapons. And, of course, she said yes. And right away they asked her, you know, is one of them pink? Because my my husband had actually built her a, a, an AR, and it's pink. And so at that point, I think she kind of knew that they knew a little bit more about her than, you know, what they, you know, just coming out and visiting. They had done their research on her. And so basically, you know, at this point, it turns into kind of a scary situation for her. And so... And before you know it, there's 11 FBI agents, and nine of them are armed, and they're all male, and they all pretty much descend on her home. They've taken her car keys, they've, you know, they've uh, taken her dog out to the backyard, and they've talked their way into her back room with her, which it was a room that she had already told them she didn't feel comfortable in that back room. Since she had moved into that house, she basically shut that door and she never used that back room for anything. She told me she felt like, you know, it was creepy in there. Mm -hmm. She called it the room of death. Uh, two of the FBI agents take her to that back room and basically corner her in that back room and you know they get a confession out of her after a while they never read her her Miranda rights and later her team you know basically filed a petition to you know have her confession thrown out because she was never read her Miranda rights and believe it or not to this day the federal judge, that district judge, has never even ruled on that. Mm. I, I had no idea that that was something that a district judge could fail to do, but he just didn't rule on it. You know, so it's just still hanging there, whether the government violated my daughter's Miranda rights or not, because the court never ruled on it. Um, so, you know, and from there, basically, I mean, because she confessed, they her in cuffs they waited for a female agent to come so that they could you know pat her down and they took her to jail and my daughter has never had a day of freedom since mm. that day uh, the first lesson there you, you never talk without an attorney there's no reason to talk uh, you know that's the first lesson there and, and like I said before we, we got guys in and out of prison five times uh, committing crimes uh, left and right did less time than this uh, now, when she gets to trial, did they try to uh, fight the charge? Did she go to trial, or did she plead guilty? She Well, they did fight it at first, and basically what they were fighting was the use of the Espionage Act on her mm. um, because, you know, that, and that to me, that's always been something that I have felt is very wrong, you know, to put her in that category and to have her, her you know, have that charge on her head for the rest of her life to me is wrong my daughter broke the law she she definitely disclosed classified information and she wasn't supposed to do that but is she guilty of espionage no and so her team tried as hard as they could to basically you know fight that espionage charge to say what she did was not espionage but when you're in a position like this the government has all the resources yeah. available to them and they basically kept, you know, just um, dragging this on and on and on. The process itself in the beginning was already dragged on and on because everyone involved had to ha have a security clearance. And in order to get a security clearance, they have to do that investigation on you. And so that takes a long time just to get, you know, her legal team cleared you know, was something of, you know, an uphill battle. And so once you have that, and then every piece of evidence, basically they had to view in a secret room, you know, that called the skiff. And so the entire process was just, it's designed so that there's no winning. And so mm -hmm. basically after all of that time spent in that county jail, you know, my daughter yeah, she caved. She she pled guilty and she took a plea deal. The government had her convinced that they were going to seek 10 years. And basically that 10 years could have been spent in pretrial with her locked up in a county jail 
or the 10 years, you know, they could get after conviction. And so basically she didn't see any way out. And so she pled guilty and she accepted a plea deal, which landed her, like you said, it's, it's a record breaking sentence, 63 months in prison for a nonviolent crime that didn't do any harm. I mean, and to keep her in prison, it serves no justice whatsoever. And surely, at the moment she was mailing that letter, she had no clue in her mind that she'd ever be facing 10 years for, for popping that little letter into the mail. I don't, I don't think so. Um, I know that, you know, they, they send them to all these classes and all this training and yeah. tell them, you know, um, about the consequences. And, you know, like she had said, when she was going through the classes, they were all using Edward Snowden as the, mm. the model not to not to follow. And, you know, in her interrogation with the FBI, she basically said, I'm not trying to be an Edward Snowden. You know, I'm, I'm just trying to tell the American people the truth. You know, so. Yeah, well, well, that alone will get you thrown in prison in the United States of America. Now, um, tell us as a mom, what's it like having a child uh, in jail, first pretrial, and then in prison? What, what's, what's the process like making phone calls, visits, gifts? Oh, my gosh. As as you said, when when you have a family member in prison, the entire family's in prison, You you stop celebrating, you stop you know, having these happy moments because there's always a piece of you that's going through hell. And that's what it's been. The county jail, it was it was just awful. My daughter was attacked. She was injured. She was denied medical care. She was denied food because she has a special diet and they basically didn't care. Um, you know, it was just, it was horrendous. I, I retired from my job so that I could move to Georgia, so that I could be there to always at least go visit with her. Our visits, I had to travel 50 minutes one way for a 30 minute visit and it was between glass on a phone. I didn't get to hug my daughter that entire time. I didn't actually get to hug her until she landed in federal prison where we can actually have, you know, visits with her, you know, in a room, you know, so all that time she was kept away from everything that she needed to, to you know, to help her through this, um, you know, and then now in the federal prison, now she's had to face COVID. And so because of the pandemic, the prison system has gone on lockdown. You know, they went on lockdown March 13th. That's when they stopped all family visits, all social visits. So we can't even go to visit with her anymore. And, you know, they're basically on a lockdown um, type of protocol to where they've stopped all the programs. They've stopped all the classes. She's no longer allowed to work. And so they're basically locked in the entire time. And, you know, and so... Again, she's she's again going through the worst of the worst of circumstances, you know, and it's just, I don't know. It's, you know, you hear of Murphy's Law. I feel like now we have reality's law. Mm. You know? right. and, and, and none of this it's, is cheap, right? None of this is cheap. Phone calls, emails, you pay for emails through JPay, you pay for stamps. Yeah. Um, none of this is cheap, you know, and you always have to have money on account. And it, 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 Ramen noodles, five bucks. <laughs> you know, like it's insane. What they, you know, sh shampoo, you know, all this kind of stuff. It's a, it's, it's a nightmare when you have a loved one in there. And they, and you, people need to remember. You're, right now, you listen to the show. Maybe you're lying in bed and you're all comfy and cozy and stuff like that. You can get up and go to the bathroom anytime you want. Right? She's there right now, and she can't do any of those things that we can do. She can't take a shower when she wants. She can't go to the fridge get a cold. Just imagine the next time you have a flu or a cold. And you're lying in bed, and your wife's, your girlfriend's bringing you a, a NyQuil and, and Tylenol and soup and candy and tea and stuff like that for your throat and all that kind of stuff. Just imagine when you're in prison and, and you got that same, or maybe even not a bad as a cold, okay? And you know, or a worse cold, you know, and, and you're sick in there. You know, you, you're going through hell, okay? There's no joke. Now, there's a hearing coming up uh, November 17th, right? Uh, now, this is a compassionate hearing, so it's a compassionate release. Yes, um, her legal team, when COVID started really um, 
exploding in the United States and especially in our prison system. Her legal team filed for compassionate release with the district court. My daughter requested compassionate release through the prison system like she was supposed to. And when she didn't receive an answer, they filed with the court. Well, the court, the judge basically denied her even a hearing and stated that he, first of all, didn't have the authority to grant her compassionate release, and even if he did have the authority, he would not do so. And so her team has filed for an appeal, and the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals has actually granted her an expedited process, and expedited for her means from April to now. She is finally getting a hearing, not this coming week, but the week after. And so at that time, the appellate court will decide whether the district court made the right ruling in her case to even grant to deny her a hearing and to deny her compassionate release. And so we'll be looking to see what the appellate court decides for her fate going forward. Do you believe she's being treated differently uh, because of political motivations? We know that uh, Mr. Trump uh, is very sensitive about any any accusations about Russia. Uh, do you think that has any effect on her treatment? Oh, it has. Yes, it has all the effect on her. I mean, everything about her case. You know, um, he actually tweeted about how unfair her sentence was, which everybody knew. She received the the longest sentence ever. Um, they stated that they wanted to make, you know, um, they wanted to make a model out of her, an example out of her, so that there were not going to be any other legal, leakers. But mm-hmm. leakers since her have not received that type of a sentence. It has to do with what she released. It has to do with the fact that President Trump didn't want this information out there. He didn't want the American people to know that Russia had actually attacked our election system in 2016. And so, yes, absolutely. And I I also feel like her treatment also has to do with the fact that she's a woman. Um, Mm -hmm. You just don't see this type of treatment for males in our system right now. You know, it just look at how women are treated so much differently. And so... You know, her being a woman in all of this as well, you know. Well, either way, you know, luckily if we we get a blessing here, she'll be out uh, early, but uh, she'll be out soon. Uh, What are her plans for after she comes out for her life? Uh, Well... Uh, She has a lot of plans, and she's been doing a lot of reading and a lot of research. Right now, what she wants to do is she does want to work toward uh, criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. What she has seen these last three years being inside of the system has horrified her, and she plans to do whatever she can to advocate for criminal justice reform and for reform of laws. She doesn't feel like it's right that people with nonviolent convictions end up sitting in prison, especially women, especially women, um, and then the conditions inside prisons. And, you know, they talk about these programs that are um, that designed to help them either rehabilitate or prepare them for life on the outside you know she basically she's seeing these things and she's saying no it's not adequate and it's not what we think it is you know um you know it's 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 a very crooked system and it's a a very backward system and so what she talks about right now is when she gets out she wants to to really work toward criminal justice reform. And then, of course, she wants to continue to teach yoga, and she wants to continue to help people to better their physical health with nutrition and exercise. Um, Another one of her dreams is she wants to start a mangrove Mm. uh, swamp-type environment here on the, the Gulf Coast where we live. You know, because she believes that mangroves can help clean up our climate and can help, you know, protect us from national or from tropical storms. And so that's another thing that she's very interested in in doing. 
Well, look, let her know. She has an open door here, open invitation to come on the opera and report anytime she wants to share uh, what's happened to her and, and what she's working on in the future. Uh, we are out of time here. We're with uh, Billy Winner Davis. Uh, check out standwithreality.org. That's a story of reality winner who's uh, wasting away in a horrible prison, uh, just recovering from COVID uh, for basically uh, no, releasing information that we all know right now that everybody has uh, at the tip of their tongues. Uh, Miss uh, Davis, what would you like to leave us with before we go? Just please keep her name out there, mm. learn about her, and uh, tell others about her. Uh, my daughter really is an exceptional young woman, and she doesn't deserve what she's going through. And this no November 17th hearing, is there a place we can write letters to or emails or call? Basically, from what I'm being told by her legal team, there's not with the appellate court. But, okay. I mean, social media is, is a good place to start as far as raising the volume. Yeah, and Billy Winter Davis has a, a Facebook page and also, too, there's a reality winner, uh, standwithreality.org. Uh, thank you so much, Billy. Thank you. I really appreciate this. If you need any, come on the air. Just you got an open invitation. Tell me you want to come back. You want to update us with uh, any new information, anything we can do to help you, okay? All right. Thank you so much. Thank you.